You're watching Giving Feedback, the Dr. Stable Way. Produced by GP Supervision Australia and presented by Dr. Katie Davies. We would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this recording was produced and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, future and their families. Talking about a topic that I guess is so integral to general practice training and professional development and our role as clinicians, and that's giving feedback. This was born really from me coming across an article in Medical Republic some months ago now, authored by Katie Davies, who's the speaker tonight, on this new model on how to give peer-to-peer -peer feedback called the Dr. Stable Way. And I read it and I knew Katie from her past background of being the New South Wales RACGP sensor and thought that sounds like a really interesting model and topic for supervisors to hear about in their in their role in training. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Katie Davies, who is a GP colleague. I'll let Katie introduce herself and to talk about this very, very, very interesting topic around feedback. So thanks, Katie. Thank you. Um, so look, nice to see you all and thank you so much for coming up to spend a little bit of time with me talking about what is a bit of a passion project for me. It's been a bit of a journey how I've got here and why I've become interested in feedback. And I suppose it started off, I've trained across a couple of different systems. So I started off in the UK and I'm an IMG and I trained in the UK to start off with. But I actually fellowed in Australia. So I did the first couple of years after medical school in the UK, a bit of locuming, and then I came across then and went into initially the physician's training pathway and then moved across to general practice, which was where I found my home. Of course, being an IMG, you know, subject to the moratorium, I trained rurally. And on my first day as a registrar, the conversation was around the fact that our training providers were actually all going to go up for tender. And so we were going to go through a training provider transition, you know, if we didn't win the tender. And that's what happened. So I started off in one training provider and then I finished then training through somewhere else as well. And so that was really interesting. And it's almost gone 360 because then, you know, as soon as I I went through fellowship and I fellowed and then found my way into the college working in the college, I actually then went through another transition of training to a slightly to the RACGP and then a restructure. So, you know, and in amongst all of that, this is in the backdrop of, you know, working in a GP in Canberra. Once I'd fellowed, was able to come a bit closer to home. We were then went through a pandemic. We stood up a respiratory clinic. I was working in the respiratory clinic. And then subsequent to that, went on to work as a sensor for the RACGP in amongst all this change. So I've really seen, I suppose, some really great diversity amongst different systems, both national systems, but training systems, different training providers, different models of standing up clinical care in pandemics. And then on top of that, going through various other leadership and mentor programs where I was looking at the development of people. So how do we develop people to reach their full potential and one of the really nice things about working at a sensor, one of the things that I enjoyed the most was that I really got to help some registrars that might be otherwise really struggling with the training program. The sensor sits in this really nice space where you get to collate lots of information from lots of different sources. And there are often really common themes that come through about what people are finding difficult or where their performance issues are or, you know, what the situation is in certain practices or areas and why those are making things hard. So I got this really nice oversight during all of that with the importance of feedback and actually how uh, continued feedback over time is really important, not only to the individual, but also the system and also, you know, in the, on a broader level in our organisations and how that really impacts on us all. With that in mind, some of the concepts that I wanted to bring together are I developed this sort of idea about what feedback looks like, what it, what it looks like to me, you know, how I see feedback through some of the research that I've done looking at some of the important aspects of feedback and how feedback can bring us together, but it can also be quite jarring and quite difficult. And sometimes it can alter relationships in a negative way and how we perhaps overcome that so that we can actually build on trust and performance rather than allowing it to disconnect us. 
And in amongst all of that, when I was looking at this, I was looking at how do we practically bring these things together? Because a lot of these, these concepts are really abstract. And so when I came to looking at this, I felt we needed a really simple strategy, something that was easy so that we could engage people, not just people that are in, interested in education and who perhaps, you know, I'm preaching to the converted a little bit, people who find value in feedback, but really everybody, so that it becomes quite a normalised thing for us culturally, so that we're not so adverse perhaps to engaging into some of these conversations into the future. And that's where Dr. Stable really was born, was trying to distill these very complex um, concepts into what was essentially an eight-letter mnemonic. And so you can tell me how I've done, and I hope you do. What I found when I was going through a lot of the, the references and that you can see here is that there's heaps on feedback. You know, there's so much out there in corporate literature and teaching aids. There's lots in the educational research space, but actually there's not so much in the peer-to-peer -peer space. There's a little bit on medical student peer-to-peer -peer teaching, but when you look at everything else, you know, it's quite small in comparison. So I was really interested in trying to generate some information in that, some interest, and also trying to make it really specific to general practice because our culture and our structure, organisational structures are quite unique. I draw a lot on these three books. So, you know, the culture map, which if you've seen giving effective feedback or communication and feedback in general practice, a cultural lens, which is another webinar that's been done by GPSA, it will also feature that book quite heavily. And that's sort of a lot of the relative difference between things like our communication styles and, you know, hierarchical preferences. But also Brené Brown's book, There to Lead, was really integral to developing the model as well, because it's, that's really dialing down into the anatomy of trust and how we are vulnerable in difficult conversations, which essentially is a lot about what feedback is. And look, there's a little marketing book there on the end made to stick because, you know, if I was trying to make a, a mnemonic or a model, I wanted to get it to be a point that was going to be easy for us to remember, easy for us to use, something that we could, you know, pull on as an easy to use strategy to get us to a point that actually, hey, maybe we didn't actually need a, a, a framework anymore. It was just more of an innate process. And also just in there, there's um, when I was part of the Future Leaders Group, and this is where I started the initial project. I worked with a doctor in Queensland, Dr. Shamani Singh, who held a couple of focus groups around some of the barriers to feedback in general practice. And although we did quite parallel projects, we actually found that our barriers, you know, when we came to meet what we found as our barriers were very, very similar. Now, this is a concept slide and it's a little bit complex. So I'm going to try and distill this picture into some words and bring it to life a bit for you. So I want you to consider that you're viewing this Rubik's Cube from point A. Now, unless you're a Rubik's Cube master, you probably don't know what the colours are on the faces that you can't see. However, we can make a few assumptions from our experiences. You know, we know what a cube is. We know it's got six sides. And because we are familiar with a Rubik's Cube, we know that each side has a different colour. So at point A, we observe three colors. Therefore, we know we have to find the missing information for three sides. Imagine you have a friend standing at point B and they can clearly describe the two sides not visible to you. You are now able to determine between you the colors on five sides. So then you work out that that last side that's sitting, you know, underneath all the others, you know, neither of you can see that. So we'll call that your shared unknown unknown. And through a bit of deduction and a Google search, together you establish the last color. So now what was a 2D image from one perspective, you have a really deep 3D understanding of what the situation in front of you is. And of course, the more we understand something, the better our problem solving, which I would argue is integral to the positive change and outcomes that you want to generate in feedback exchanges. So, you know, even if you're a Rubik's Cube master, every time you engage in feedback, you have the opportunity to learn about yourself and your perspective because you've explored the observation relative to someone else. So when we open up what learning means in our feedback exchanges, both parties have the opportunity to experience the breadth and depth of learning 
even if initially the lessons drawn out seem completely unrelated to the purpose of the discussion. So, and look, you know, I think best of all is that if we consider that feedback is a potential tool that we can use to understand each other's points of view, and, you know, the aim is to improve the outcomes for both parties, it becomes a really nice gateway to building some professional and relational trust, which, you know, I think then facilitates further engagement. And if you move beyond that and embed these processes and working, you know, positive working alliances into your team's foundation, you build a really nice culture. And I think I came across a concept called VUCA, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with military terms, but it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguity. And I feel like we've been living in a really VUCA few years, you know, with all the change. And so I feel like if we can build this culture, then it helps us to push back against a lot of that volatility, uncertain, complex and ambiguity nature that we see in general practice. I'm going to just, before I go on to talk about the model, talk about a few things that I picked up along the way that I think help to explain or have helped for me to put into context why sometimes feedback goes a bit sideways. And one of the main things that I want to talk about is how we transmit messages and how we communicate, which is easier to understand, I think, when you've got a few examples. So this slide is taken from um, Erin Meyer's book. And when I read it, I kind of laughed because I was like, oh, my goodness, how does anyone understand what on earth I'm saying? This is an example of... There's a chapter two is all about how we experience different feedback and that and the Dutch comparative to the British are quite direct and explicit communicators, whereas the British relative to the Dutch are quite implicit and indirect. So what that means is British people will often have a second meaning to what they say. So when I say something like, hmm, that's very interesting, what I actually mean is, I don't like it. But, you know, if you were a British person, you would understand that because culturally we communicate in the same way. However, because the Dutch relative to the British are quite explicit and direct, actually, when I say very interesting, what they hear is very interesting. He is impressed. And so you can see my implicit meaning is I don't like it. And what someone's picking up is he is impressed, which are completely opposite meanings to essentially the same words. Similarly, if I was to say something like, hmm, please think some more about that. What I actually mean is that's a bad idea. Don't do it. Whereas somebody may interpret that differently as it's a good idea. Keep developing it, which I think, you know, for me sounds a little bit funny. I found that quite humorous, but I think is probably a very clear example of how you can be saying something and have completely different, derive different meanings from the same words. Similarly, I think there's Erin Meyer talks about this. There are many faces of polite. So in British culture, sometimes, you know, if you're overly direct, it's considered rude. And so considering where you are relative to culture to somebody else, I think it can change how you perhaps broach some of the messages or, you know, implicit messaging. So how are we going to get around this? Well, I broke this down a little bit. There's a few little tips in the Erin Meyer book, which I really quite liked. The trick is just to not do anything too radical. So, you know, you're going to have to push yourself out of your comfort zone a little, but don't completely flip your communication style if you identify somebody has a different style to you. The best thing to do is probably use some upgraders or downgraders to soften or strengthen some of the messages you know, depending on who you're communicating to. So for example, you know, I'm quite implicit and indirect with my messaging. So when I'm talking to somebody who is more explicit and direct, I have to be really clear. So I'm I'm using explicit languages and sometimes I'm actually upgrading what I'm saying because my natural inclination is to use perhaps a bit, sort of, slightly, which are all downgrading the message strength, when in fact what I probably should do is upgrade what I'm saying at the time. But because I don't feel comfortable all the time being direct, the best I should probably get away with is maybe a few upgraders in there just to strengthen what I'm saying so that I can transmit my message a little bit more clearly. 
And look, the other thing that I took away from this is that clear is kind and unclear is unkind. So that's one of the really good messages that comes through the Brené Brown book and also in the Erin Meyer book is that because we have implicit messaging and that's really culturally embedded, it's going to get very confusing very quickly if you are working with implicit messaging particularly if you're both from cultures that use implied messages. So it's best to be explicit and be quite literal when you're communicating what the observation of the problem is. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but I found this an interesting concept. Again, this is taken from the Erin Meyer book, and it's this idea about the concept of power distance and how that's experienced in various cultures in different ways. So you can see here, comparative to Australia, the UK is quite hierarchical, but the UK compared to Japan is much more egalitarian. And this plays out in a variety of ways, but how I experienced it when I came to Australia was in one small way would be like, you know, I would refer to people by their professional title. So, you know, I'd call them Dr. So-and-so or, and I'd refer to people like that. Whereas in Australia, I tend to find that people very much use their first names. So when I was working with my supervisor as a, when I was a registrar, I think it took me about three years or two years, 18 months, something like that, to actually use his first name. And when I did, he was so excited. He was just like, yes. Um, he'd actually felt quite uncomfortable with me referring to him as, you know, Dr. Harrison, because it was not something that he was particularly used to. I think it made him feel a bit uncomfortable. Whereas for me, because I felt this concept of power distance, it was a, a really mark of respect. And so the one thing I would say about this is that, you know, when we talk about culture, sometimes it's really difficult to figure out where you sit in relation to everybody else, because as one analogy says, you know, if it does a fish know it's in water. So if you're born in the same place and you're not moved to another place to experience a sec another culture in any big way, then how do you know what your culture is? I'd like you to just have a little think about how you might approach feedback in a couple of different scenarios. So the first one is imagine somebody that you consider a boss or someone in a slightly higher organizational capacity to you and think about how you might enter into a feedback exchange with them. Think about little things like, is it formal or informal? What's your body language like? What sort of language are you using? Are you relaxed? Is it a very open discussion? And then when you've had a little time to sort of visualize what that looks like for you, I want you to have a little think about a peer. So somebody maybe that works in the next consult room, similar organizational level. And again, just imagine what that looks like. How are you referring to each other? What's the language that you're using? Is it more or less formal comparative to the previous scenario? And then I want you to imagine how it is with your registrar. So when you're entering into a feedback exchange with your registrar, what does that look like? Are you sitting opposite each other? Are they calling you doctor? Or are they using your first name? And just have a little think about the differences in those situations. If you're a little bit like me, and that is probably more hierarchical compared to perhaps some Australians, you will have imagined maybe that in each scenario, your behavior changed a little bit. You know, I was maybe a bit more formal with my boss, whereas I was quite casual with my peer. Whereas when I stepped into the room with a registrar, I was definitely a bit more in charge in that space. And so that tells me that because I'm perceiving a difference between those three, that actually I'm thinking hierarchically a little. If everything was a bit more similar for you and you were casual in all spaces or formal in all spaces, then it might be that you think less hierarchically when it comes to power distance. And that can sometimes change how we approach our feedback conversations. I just wanted to draw your attention to something called the braving inventory. So this is Brené Brown's concept and she calls it dissecting the anatomy of trust. In feedback conversations, I found that one of the key things about engaging in the feedback conversation is that you feel safe. And that's one of the things that really facilitates further engagement and, you know, builds connection and relationships. And so it was really important for me to build trust into the model with an understanding that actually if we wanted it to be successful, we needed to feel safe doing so. 
this is the concept of talking about boundaries. You know, we respect each other's boundaries. We can say no and we are, we can be explicit. And that's boundaries, as we know, are important for helping us feel secure. Reliability. Be aware of your competences and limitations and balance competing priorities. It sounds easy, but actually how this looks in reality for me is a bit like this. I'll see someone, I know I've got to say something to them, but we're between patients and there's no time. Or I'm running out of the door to get my kids and I've got to pass a message. But you can't really do feedback like that in any depth. So it's a case of, you know, making sure that actually you've got the time, the space, and you are cognizant of the time limitations and time pressures and the other person's agenda as well. Accountability, own your mistakes and apologize and make amends. So again, that's a bit more about relationship building and being comfortable with vulnerability. So it may be that there's an error to discuss. And in which case, if you're receiving that message, how are you going to process it? Often when we're challenged a bit like that, we can get defensive or upset. And, and actually that can be a barrier to reflection and, and building connections. So, so really it's about, I guess, owning that. And also, you know, we don't deliver feedback perfectly every time either. So when that happens and you, you realise that it's gone a bit sideways, it's more about just owning up quickly and early and just saying, oops, sorry, that wasn't quite what I intended. And then, you know, you smooth over that trust connection and you keep going. So Vault is about confidentiality. So in Brenna Brown's one, she talks a lot about you're a Vault, you don't say anything. But of course, we can't really do that in medicine because, you know, there are times that we do have to escalate things. And really, so it's just being open about the levels of confidentiality that there are and, you know, what the intention is and why. And more often than not, if there is something escalated from a registrar point of view, usually I found it's more to do about helping them do better and so the intention is not punitive the intention is actually to improve and to help and when you frame things a bit like that sometimes it becomes less threatening integrity choose what is right over what is easy ouch it's a difficult space I think sometimes to lead into integrity but integrity and honesty and sincerity I suppose are really key to I think trust and making this whole thing really work and rolling on from that non-judgment. So, you know, we're all going to make mistakes. That's what happens. But in order to be supportive, supportive colleagues, supportive mentors and supportive receivers of feedback, trying to exercise non-judgment, even when things perhaps we would have done things differently. And generosity. And look, and I think this is a really nice one because it acknowledges the receiver's responsibility in the feedback scenario. So, you know, extend the most generous interpretation possible to the intentional words and actions of others. So, you know, again, we're not going to get this right all the time, but most of the time the intention is to improve or help somebody else. And so when you judge it by intentions and not necessarily always actions, we have this really nice space with which it allows you to make mistakes and recover and get better. So just other little things. The first is don't fear dissent. And this was something that I got taught by a really a good lawyer, actually, within the college. And this was more in a group discussion, decision-making space. This comes from a couple of different points. The first is that often different perspectives and enrich a discussion and you get different viewpoints, which draws out different lessons. The second is that it can be quite cultural. So some schools of thought in France, for example, argument, counter-argument are actually really embedded in how you debate. Whereas in other cultures, one's wrapped up with perhaps Confucianism and harmony. Harmony is actually really important. And so arguing dissent, particularly in group environments, is actually quite unusual, quite frowned upon. So there can be quite a cultural difference there as well. But generally speaking, if it comes up, try not to push it away. There's often something you can draw out from it. The Feel free to check understanding explicitly. So agreeing is not the same as understanding. And I know you know, all know this. And that just comes into some of this active listening and communication that I'm sure you're all very well aware of. I'm very pro embedding this into culture and normalizing this so it becomes less of a big deal. I really have a, a vision that maybe, you know, this is becomes part of our learning culture. And so rather than it just being from a perhaps a supervisor registrar point of view, that it becomes a practice wide cultural 
you know, something that's adapted will take on. And that way it becomes sort of less awkward all round. And it's just acknowledging as well that giving and receiving feedback is awkward. And so we're just going to have to lean into that discomfort a little bit and practice both. And, you know, progress over perfection, failing or not succeeding is just another type of learning. I was in the habit of doing what we used to call the shit sandwich, where you said something nice and then you put the the bad message in the middle and then said something nice again. And I've had a couple of people go away from that elated that they've had this good stuff said about I haven't heard the bit in the middle at all. So I've had to make a conscious effort to not do that because the message gets lost. It's a really interesting comment because that is, and I was going to mention it actually on the next couple of slides, it's a really quite a cultural concept, that one. So if you were perhaps in America, often there's this, it would have been a great way to give feedback. So they often use two softeners and one to the message, the like negative message they want to get across. Whereas you're right, in other cultures, had you have said that in France, for example, that would have been just completely lost because actually the way that they deliver feedback in France is very direct and, you know, straight to the point. Similarly in Germany, it's interesting, I think, how we, when we think about feedback, we often think about it in the context of what we would like. And so what we need to think about it is in the context of where we are relative to somebody else and how they might receive that message, which I think is a bit of a skill. But certainly if you get some time, reading the Erin Meyer book is really good for just broad brushstrokes of cultural stuff. So I had a similar an episode where I was helping out with this mock CCE exams with a bunch of registrars and I gave some feedback to a registrar after they had done a, a mock CC question. And because I didn't know this registrar and hadn't really met her, I wasn't kind of aware until later on that they kind of had quite a lot of anxiety about getting feedback. And so then learned later on that actually it was taken in a very different manner and light to how I meant it, which was really sort of, as Angela said, sort of that saying what you did well first and then, and I think of it as what could be improved upon. But all she heard was the stuff that could be improved upon and took it as very much as I completely bombed that in that case and I would have failed. And I had to sort of later go back once I learned that this had caused heightened anxiety in someone who already had a bit of anxiety to then try and go and fix that situation. And that was quite difficult because, Mm. yeah, it was giving it to somebody that was, it was literally on a like a Zoom type session where I didn't even, I hadn't met that registrar I didn't know them very well to know how to gauge my feedback thank you yeah I think that's really really tricky and I think it's also really difficult to do it over a computer because you lose all the non-verbal cues very easily yeah totally which I think gives us heaps of information about how we actually approach a subject when we don't actually know the people particularly well. But look, I think you went back and you tried to fix it. By the sounds of it, you tried to go back and improve the situation. And I think that's probably all you could have done in that situation, you know. And that was one of the things that comes through in the previous slides was that if there's something that you've picked up that didn't go so okay, that's all right. It's going to happen. And you went back and you invested in that relationship. And so hopefully you got to a better place than you would have done otherwise. I think so. But for a little while, it caused me a lot of anxiety because uh, I felt like I'd offended her in some way. And I think, you know, giving feedback over the phone is is a similar kind of experience. You you lose a lot of the the nonverbal cues. Agreed. And Baz, you're making me kind of extrapolate this conversation, which is really about feedback to learners, feedback to peers, to our role as clinicians as well. And not that Mm. we're giving feedback to patients so much as communicating with them. Some of certainly some of these cultural differences exist and can influence the way communications received. And that's probably another conversation in itself. There are a number of models of a variety of sophistication many of which people will know, which I don't think there's time or need to go through. Safe to say that they are described to some degree in the GPSA feedback guide, which we sort of connect a little bit to this. But really the basis of this is a new model that Katie's developed and hopeful that might allow a bit more sort of confidence and clarity in the way feedback's delivered. So Katie, I'll let you speak to that. 
Yeah, look, thank you. And the idea is that it just takes some of the uncertainty out of the exchanges. So, you know, if you're somebody that does this all the time, the chances are you probably don't need a model. But having said that, if you're somebody that goes into exchanges, you're not quite sure of a strategy. This is kind of a, I wanted to give people a practical element that they could use to have those difficult conversations. And I've shamelessly piggybacked it to try and aid people's memory onto a very well-known resuscitation guideline. <laughs> so you'll see danger and response in there and you'll hopefully recognize where that came from. But I've adapted it a little bit. So danger is, okay, well, look, this is a potentially vulnerable and comfortable space. You know, let's set the scene. Probably not necessarily going to shout it in the coffee room at work. Probably best to do it somewhere you've got a little more privacy, particularly if you've got somebody who might feel take messages on in quite a personal way. Response, look, that's mainly about boundary setting. So it's okay for the other person to not be in the right space to be able to receive feedback. And we have to respect that boundary. So we allow the other person to actually, you know, set a time for when they're ready to draw learnings from. And that will create hopefully a bit of a sense of security and safety. Give them a little bit of processing time as well if it's arranged for a slightly later time. Situation. So look, this is just the situation, the observation that you want to bring. I think in this scenario, I would just deliver it as you can, as clearly as you can, without really trying to embellish it too much. And then rather than leaping in with what you think they should do straight up, just ask them about it. So, you know, how did you see this from your point of view? You know, what happened here? And then not only are you going to get some extra information that's perhaps invisible to you, so that's side B, you know, it allows you to be able to gauge where the other person is psychologically and emotionally in response to that particular situation. And then, you know, acknowledgement's mainly about just understanding the perspective of somebody else and saying, hey, you know, I wasn't there. This sounds like it was, it went down for these reasons. And I understand how these things go because we've all been here, we've all done this in various ways. And the balance is then allowing you to offer your counter perspective. How do you see things? Where do you think things could have been done differently? Or where you think maybe there are knowledge gaps or things that maybe could be found? And then that backwards and forwards then will often draw out some extra learnings that you'll both end up pulling out some learnings from one way or the other. And so that's this lesson. So you develop something a bit collaboratively through this backwards and forwards of perspective, getting to the lessons that you both draw out from. And then like every good feedback model at the end, there's a bit of an evaluation. So, you know, how did it go? Did you both leave the exchange feeling OK, did you feel like it was productive? Are you likely to go and do it again? And you can do that explicitly together or you can be quite reflective about it. I'm somebody who is often quite keen for explicit stuff. And I will ask my colleagues if I've said, you know, like, is that OK? How does that sound? You know, that type of stuff. Whereas you might feel a bit more comfortable just reflecting on that individually or from that scenario. So this is your chance to have a little play with some of the concepts discussed and with the Dr. Stable model, acknowledging that I want you to have fun with this. So try not to get anxious or stressed. So a fellow colleague starts in your practice. You have seen some of the same patients and noticed from the notes that they've been prescribing as Zempic for weight loss. You're aware that this is off-label and counter to the TGA advice. You've decided to talk to your colleague about their prescribing practice. We didn't run it so much as a um, a scenario, but talked about approaches. And I think probably the two key things there were as colleagues approaching it with more of a curiosity to try and understand what's going on there and, and whether or not there might be issues that maybe you hadn't considered, like whether they were receiving undue pressure and weren't really sure how to manage that, particularly if they're new in the practice and didn't want to upset people by refusal. Those sorts of issues may not be evident at the outset. Thank you, Angela. Yes. I think that those first two, the D and the R, are going to determine what happens. They're very important. And I like the idea that you should think about how you start and not just go straight into asking a question. You've got to establish a buy and get them to buy into the, the discussion. Thank you, Peter. That's a really, I think, a really good observation. I must say, I really like the E at the end, and I'm a proponent of supervisors and educators 
pulling back the curtains to a degree and not hiding behind this medical education theory in what we do, but actually saying, this is how I like to deliver feedback. And in fact, at the end, I'm going to ask you about how it went and we can be explicit about that and get a sense of it. And, and you know, it's tricky and awkward, and but I want to do it well and I want your feedback. So I really, I like the E. I think that notion of getting an evaluation is important. Rather than the model itself, I just want to take a step back and leave a comment about as we found from what Katie described, there's so many cultural and different aspects to it. And what Baz had the difficulty as well, you can see that it's very important that you actually know that person you're giving feedback to. So in the situational thing where you're actually giving feedback to as a supervisor to a registrar, you got the boundaries, you know what your role is. So it's much easier to actually set up the scenario for that. I would find it very difficult to actually give any feedback to a peer or colleague because we need to actually first find what our boundaries are there. Boundaries in the sense that if you're giving feedback, there should have been some implied, either explicit or implied consent that you're going to give feedback because that's an independent practitioner. And for you to actually jump in and make comments about the practice, unless you got some implied consent, I think it would be quite detrimental to relationships and would, could, could be quite dangerous. Other thing is what that lovely model that uh, Katie showed about how the Dutch and English interpretations are. Sometimes we just don't know and we could actually be giving feedback in a very wrong manner. And you can see that both to feedback to registrars, but also when we are communicating with patients and they can be taken in so many different ways. So yeah. I think my difficulty is with peers giving feedback, I would want to actually have a concrete structure. For example, we could actually have a practice meeting where you could actually discuss difficult situations and raise it up that way. So that's much more indirect, non-confrontational type of situation. So just my comment about that. That's absolutely right. I think I think that comes also along with what the practice culture is. So part of this is also trying to embed this into culture so that actually it's a, an expectation like it is with a supervisor to a registrar perhaps rather than just something that is really awkward to do because culturally it's actually very difficult. How I go about that a little bit in my practice is that, you know, whenever there's somebody new... I go and talk to them about feedback as soon as they come through the door for my poor colleagues. And so, and I say something like, look, if you see something in the notes where you think that actually I could do something better, I want you to come and tell me about it because I'd rather know and I'd rather improve and hear about it from you than, you know, from somebody else. And similarly, you know, most people are quite open and receptive to that. And then they turn around and go, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm happy then if you come and say something to me as well and so then it just starts you sort of always get this explicit consent right up front and set the expectation early so that you know hey this is what I want you know come and talk to me but if you don't have those conversations and you're right you see these observations and you feel nervous about approaching them then absolutely you need consent so and that's where that danger and response come into it it's about actually asking for consent and allowing the other person to set some boundaries around that so that you know if they would rather you know if they don't want to then you know that there, there might be another way to approach that and you're right in that sometimes giving indirect group feedback around common problems is a really nice way to raise common points of contention in a way that is not direct and not personal and that is also a very okay way of doing it if that is how the practice culture is with you so look I think there are many ways to do it but I think also in this high change environment in particular building this bravery around difficult discussions because we can't be on top of everything all the time as individuals it's going to be really important for us to support each other with our performance but it does take a mindset shift particularly with peers where we don't have hierarchy in a hierarchical learning environment there's an expectation for feedback in a peer-to-peer -peer space where we're not actually always the part of the same organization we're individual contractors it's a much harder thing to broach but is probably really integral to our psychological well-being and our connection if we can do it really well. Thanks, Katie. 
I would like to thank you very much for putting this session together, for I think raising our awareness of this topic. And as I was saying to you, our people are in these small groups, really, this is such an important aspect of what we do. And you're not just providing some kind of this is what you should do, but it's that really nuanced approach to how to do this better and appreciate the way we as individuals can adapt it to best meet the needs of our learners, our peers and ourselves. So thank you so very much. Oh, thank you for your kind support for you and the GPSA team. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. We'd love your feedback. Please comment or subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates on new videos. If you'd like to ask a question or suggest a topic, you can contact us via our website at gpsa.org.au. GP Supervision Australia is supported by funding from the Australian Government under the Australian General Practice Training Programme.